When was the last time you thought of, or perhaps even tested, your product in the browser that made the very early web popular? And no, I'm not talking about NCSA Mosaic. And I'm not talking about Nexus, which was the first browser. It was developed for the Next platform by Tim Berners-Lee. It had a feature-rich GUI. You could interact with it with a mouse. It loaded images. It even had a hypertext editor as part of it. If you had $6,500 in 1989, that is. This was really more of a proof of concept. No, the browser that I'm talking about is the line mode browser. This is a photograph in lieu of a screenshot of the line mode browser. Today, we'd call this a minimum viable product. It was actually the second browser created at CERN, and it wasn't created by Tim Berners-Lee. That honor fell to this woman, Nicola Pello. She was a math student from the UK who was at CERN, and this is the only picture that we have of her. From December 1990 through the summer of 1991, she coded a text-based browser that could be run on almost anything. And when I say almost anything, I mean almost anything. Here it is running on a teletype machine. Tim Berners-Lee announced the project on August 6, 1991, on the alt.hypertext newsgroup. The release version was 0 0.9. And 10 days later, after feedback, version 0 0.11 was announced. And version 0 0.12 was available before the end of the month. Just to get a little further into some of the history, the code continued to be developed. And 20 months later, in April of 1993, the software for the World Wide Web, including the line mode browser code, as well as the HTTPD server code, was released into the public domain. Apparently, that's because CERN didn't want to pay the BSD filing license, which was a couple hundred francs, making it, in my opinion, the first open source software project. And the rest, as they say, is history. So here we have a video of the line mode browser version 0 0.12 running on an IBM AIX system at CERN. And what could this browser do? Well, it could open plain text in HTML files, either off of the local file system or off of a simple HTTP server. It provided a text-based mechanism for interacting uh, with the pages that were loaded so that you could follow links, you could traverse the history of pages visited, and you could also search against an index. It handled 21 HTML elements, or tags as they were being called at the time, including some that are no longer in use, such as HP for highlighted phrase and H0, which was basically a substitute for title. Any HTML tag that wasn't understood, the browser just simply threw away, but would preserve the content. The line mode browser had a very simple embedded style sheet of sorts, 12 styles, including those for uh, heading one through six, paragraph, lists, address, et cetera. It didn't support character entities, tables, form elements, images, custom styles, redirects, scripts, HTTPS. Obviously, none of these things existed. So in September 2013, a group of web enthusiasts got together at CERN and built an emulator of the line mode browser so that we could experience the early web through something similar without having to compile that old C application. So the website's available at line-mode.cern.ch. The emulator itself is built out of modern web technologies. And we can 
take a look at the page that Eric had brought up earlier, the very first web page. We can look at that in the emulator. The emulator itself runs off of a node server acting as a proxy for all of the HTTP traffic. A number of HTML elements are removed from the incoming HTML. Other CSS and scripts are added in order to progressively enhance the resulting uh, markup. So if we press Enter, we can scroll. We can type T to go back to the top. We've even got the help page. And we can navigate back. We did our best in order to emulate the fonts using HTML5 audio in order to mimic the keyboard sounds. So hopefully it feels pretty authentic. Now let's take a look at a couple of web pages just to see how well they hold up in this. So first, we'll try the W3C. And as you can see here, we pretty much get straight to content. As we scroll through the page, we get the main content of the site. And at any point, we can choose a link by typing in the number that's associated with it. Oh, but it looks like the page that I navigated to has some uh, inline scripts and styles. So it may take me a while to get there. Oh, there we go. So not too bad. Let's try the FluentConf web website. Got an awful lot of JavaScript first. We'll get there, I promise. <laughs> There's the title. <laughs> Sometimes our techniques to optimize for performance don't work on those early browsers. Here we go. Oh, wait. There we go. There's some content. Let's take a look at GitHub, something we probably all use on a regular basis. GitHub does a really nice job here. Looks like it's got most of its uh, scripts and CSS external. And this is actually the page for the uh, repo for the line mode browser. Stack Overflow, something some of us probably visit from time to time, is also pretty accessible. And I'm going to jump over to Twitter. Well, first of all, there are clearly some characters coming in that couldn't be parsed correctly or displayed correctly. Uh, most of what I get here is clearly text that was meant to be manipulated by some JavaScript. Lots of random strings, a little bit of navigation. But as I get towards the bottom of the page, I get lots and lots of things like close, log in, remember, forgot password, dismiss, close, previous, next, etc. So although the line mode browser emulator has a few quirks, it serves as a really good reminder that progressive enhancement is an important development approach. Progressive enhancement facilitates both a backwards compatible and future friendly web which makes for a more interoperable web. And if you're iterating on a minimum viable product, or really any project, be it just at the architecture level or for the overall product, a progressively enhanced site makes it easier to ensure functionality isn't lost or broken. And the fact that the early browser itself was a minimum viable product helps to prove to any monolithic waterfall organizations out there, that this approach does, in fact, work. 
All the resources that I showed to you are available online, and I encourage everyone to get involved, learn as much as you can about the early history of the web, and relive the early days. Thank you.